If I was to ask you to define the purpose of a weapon on the battlefield, I'm sure most of the responses we would get would be somewhere along the lines of to kill the enemy. This is not an inaccurate definition, but it's also not a complete one. As the writer George R. R. Martin once wrote, fear cuts deeper than swords, and military leaders throughout history have been acutely aware of this fact. As a result, a weapon's effectiveness has often been judged not solely on their effectiveness at killing the enemy, but the level of fear they can instill upon the survivors, and how that fear can spread amongst an enemy army. Historically, a great deal of importance has been placed on making weapons look ferocious, but in the last century of warfare, there has been an increasing appreciation of the use of sound as a weapon. This appreciation has come from over 100 years of industrial-inspired warfare, where technology has produced a whole host of weapons, each with their own unique sounds that coupled with their lethality have given rise to a series of weapons that strike terror in those that have faced them. In this episode of Wars of the World, we're going to explore the sounds of four such terrifying weapons from the Second World War, and examine their impact on the battlefield and the war as a whole. When it boils down to it, once all the advanced technology, such as aircraft and tanks, have finished softening up an enemy, the battle on land will eventually be decided by two groups of soldiers with guns. It is an inescapable fact that aircraft cannot hold ground, and while tanks can, they require fuel, maintenance and ammunition, while at the same time are vulnerable to enemy troops hiding in forests or buildings armed with anti-tank weapons, such as a bazooka or the vaunted Panzerfaust. It is for these reasons that there will always be a place for the infantrymen in warfare, and as a result, so too will there be a place for infantry weapons. But while many have become symbolic to the nature of the wars in which they have fought through their appearances, such as the legendary M1 Garand, or the German MP40 of World War II fame, only a handful have achieved such notoriety for the sound they produced and how that sound became part of its effectiveness in suppressing enemy movements. One such distinctive sounding weapon is the German MG42 machine gun, designed as a more cost-effective alternative to the earlier MG34. The MG42 afforded German infantry extraordinary powerful area denial weapon, meaning that it was able to fire enough rounds to stop a numerically superior force from crossing any open ground where there would be little cover for them to escape its deadly load of 7.92mm bullets. Even though it was supposed to be a budget alternative to its predecessor, the MG42 was able to spit out a staggering 1200 rounds a minute. Compared to the MG34's 850, itself an already impressive figure. When you consider most equivalent allied weapons fired in the region of 600 rounds, this very high rate of fire had an unexpected advantage for the Germans, for when fired continuously, the MG42 produced a very distinctive dull sound, which meant that when Allied soldiers found themselves on the receiving end of this weapon, they knew how formidable the German position ahead of them were. This instilled a degree of fear, and even hesitation in combat, to such an extent that the US Army went out of their way to produce propaganda and training videos for new recruits, which tried to downplay the weapon's effectiveness, emphasizing some of its faults and explaining tactics that had proven successful. One such tactic was to simply wait for the two German operators to simply run out of bullets and attack while they reloaded. But even this was a risky move, for it took a well-trained crew around three to four seconds to reload and start firing again. Allied soldiers quickly came up with nicknames for the sound the weapon made, but the most common example was Hitler's buzzsaw, since US soldiers who had come from working in the mills likened the sound to a buzzsaw cutting through wood. <laughs> 
During the First World War, the generals in the Imperial Russian Army referred to artillery as the God of War, for it could rain down devastation from the heavens, not only destroying enemy troop formations, but also in many cases literally reshaping the land on which battles were fought, such was its power. While Lenin and his communist forces may have done away with most of the old imperial ways, after the 1917 revolution, this high regard for artillery was one of the few ways of thinking that prevailed into the Soviet era. The Soviet Union's Red Army always favoured one tactic above all other, and that was to simply overwhelm an enemy with their sheer weight of numbers, and of course heavy firepower. As the world seemed to be rearming in the late 1930s, Soviet engineers began development of a new artillery piece, but instead of the usual gun-type weapon, this one would employ rockets instead of explosive shells. The result was the Katyusha rocket artillery system. Rocket artillery was by no means a new weapon in 1939. The ancestry of the weapons, like the Katyusha, can be traced back to ancient China, but they had never really seen wide-scale adoption by the industrial powers of Europe and North America who preferred the gun-type artillery, mainly because, until the 1930s, the chemistry wasn't available for them to have the range to be effective weapons. The Katyusha, on the other hand, and others like it, were now starting to compete conventional artillery, and offered some notable advantages. For one thing, the launcher was extremely cheap, simple to build, and could be mounted on any number of vehicles, already being produced with little effort. This had the added advantage that it was very mobile, being able to relocate quickly after firing its full salvo, thus making it difficult for the German army to fire a counter barrage of artillery shells. The Katyusha rockets could deliver a deadly explosive payload onto a large target area, and could devastate troop or tank formations alike with great efficiency. But there were two notable drawbacks. Firstly, the rockets proved to be less accurate than artillery shells, meaning they were only really effective when attacking a large target area, such as a staging ground or defensive line. Secondly, it took considerably longer than artillery guns to reload a full salvo. Nevertheless, for the Soviets, the advantages far outweighed the drawbacks, and over a hundred thousand vehicles were produced. For the German soldiers, the sound of the Katyusha, as it was fired and then flew through the sky, came to be the soundtrack to their misery on the Eastern Front. They nicknamed it Stalin's Organ, in reference to the launchers which resemble a church pipe organ, and became traumatized by the distinctive howling of the rockets as they raced their targets. The German troops huddled in their foxholes would be forced to listen to the Katyusha's terrible song before the ground shook with an explosion as they landed, all the while wondering if the next one would land on them. It would be enough to drive even the most hardened SS soldiers mad with fear. Between September 7th, 1940 and May 11th, 1941, the cities of the United Kingdom were subjected to a series of air raids by bombers of the German Luftwaffe or Air Force. Dubbed the Blitz by the British press, after the German word for lightning, the goal of the campaign was to not only damage Britain's ability to manufacture war materials, such as aircraft, ships and tanks, but to also terrorise the British people into submission. It was hoped by the Nazi leadership that such terror tactics would lead to the British people demanding surrender, if only to end the bombing. However, in this regard, it failed, as the only thing the British people demanded of their leaders was for British bombers to take revenge against German cities, something the British leadership seemed more than happy to oblige. After May 1941, Hitler relocated his bomber fleets eastward to face the Soviet Union, but he never gave up on the idea of terrorising the British into submission, and turned to his scientists to produce new and even more frightening Wonderwaff, or miracle weapons, to do just that. One of the fruits of this technologically driven campaign was the V-1 flying bomb. Work on the weapon actually began at the famous Pienemund facility, while German troops still were consolidating their hold on Poland in 1939. 
but it would not be ready for deployment until just under a week after the Allies landed on the Normandy beaches in June 1944. The V-1 was a simple weapon, being 27 feet long and built of welded steel, on the sides of which were two plywood wings and above the rear section was a pulse jet engine. The V-1 was launched from a large fixed launch ramp and could carry its deadly 1,870 pound warhead around 160 miles at a speed of around 400 miles per hour, very high for the time, meaning most interceptors such as the Supermarine Spitfire or P-51D Mustang would have just a few miles an hour of overtake. Fortunately, the V-1 was anything but accurate, having a primitive gyro compass navigation system but this did not concern Hitler, who wanted to use them against London and continue his campaign of terror bombing. The impact of these flying bombs on the public was startling. One V1 could wipe out a London street, while the attacks often seemed to come from nowhere, increasing their fear factor. However, it was the V1's unique sound that probably had the biggest impact on the city's inhabitants. Its pulse jet engine produced a dull drone as it flew overhead that could be heard for miles. But it was not this sound that actually instilled the fear, it was when the sound stopped. For it was then that the V-1 would begin its dive to Earth to inflict its devastation. From a strategic level, the Allied leadership knew that the V-1s could do very little to upset the invasion of Fortress Europe. However, the British population demanded a counter to these terrifying forerunners to the modern cruise missile. This forced the Allied leadership to divert aircraft that would have otherwise supported the breakout from Normandy to start waging a campaign against their launch sites and manufacturing plants. The Royal Air Force also deployed its first operational jet fighter, the then highly secretive Gloucester Meteor, to intercept them, although early efforts were docked by unreliable weapons, leading some pilots to actually try to flip them over using their wings as they raced by so as to send them hurtling into empty fields rather than the city. In the end, however, it was the Allied march through Europe that would bring an end to the V-1's reign of terror, after Allied troops overran the launch sites and the V-1 was no longer in range of London. As we touched upon in the previous entry, the leadership of Nazi Germany firmly believed in the use of terror as a weapon, but even under the most optimal conditions, the V-1 was not a weapon that was truly effective against the enemy. However, there was another weapon in the German arsenal that would not only strike fear into the enemy with its terrible sound, but for a time at least, it was one of the most useful tactical weapons in operation. This was the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. As Germany rearmed in the 1930s, the Nazi military commanders mainly saw aircraft as a tool with which to support the army on the battlefield. This saw them prioritize short-range aircraft that could support the ground forces and protect them from enemy air attack. One of the aircraft that emerged in this period was the Junkers Ju-87, which was one of an increasing number of aircraft the world over, optimized for dive bombing which at that time was the only truly accurate way for an aircraft to bomb targets as small as tanks, bridges, or ships. With its distinctive inverted gull-shaped wings, it cut a menacing profile even when sat on the ground. It was often likened to a vulture stalking around for easy prey to pick off. During the invasion of Poland, and then in the Blitzkrieg in the West, German fighter pilots reigned supreme, allowing the Stuka pilots to attack targets at will their accuracy alone was terrifying enough for Allied soldiers as they droned overhead before beginning their death dive, but the German High Command wanted to capitalize on the fear this bird of prey could instill, and so they came up with a novel plan. They fitted a siren in the wings that would wail loudly as the aircraft dived onto its target. The siren was known as the Jericho Trumpet in reference to the biblical story of the walls of Jericho falling after the prolonged blowing of trumpets by the attacking enemy. The purpose of this was to terrify enemy troops who would hear the sound and either flee knowing that the Stuka was about to destroy their vehicles or additionally leave the troops rattled with such shell shock after the attack that they would eventually desert rather than face the Stukas again 
The fitting of the sirens did have an unfortunate consequence for the aircraft, however, as it slowed the already sluggish Stuka down by up to 20 miles per hour, making them easier to intercept by enemy fighters. But this was of little concern in the early days of the war, since the Luftwaffe enjoyed almost total air supremacy. Thus, the Stuka was able to blaze a path of terror across the Eastern and Western Europe, the Balkans, and North Africa. But it was not to last. As the war burned on, the fortunes of the Luftwaffe began to change. The Allies soon began producing more advanced versions of fighters, such as the American Mustang, the British Spitfire, and the Soviet Yak-9, some of which were nearly twice the speed of the Stuka. Even worse for the German pilots, the Allies enjoyed a massive numerical advantage, while Allied training had progressed to the stage where even new pilots were now a threat to the seasoned Nazi pilots. By the end of 1944, the skies over Europe belonged to the Allies, yet the Stuka pilots were still being sent out, where they were attacked by flocks of high-performance Allied fighters. The German fighter pilots who had protected them in the early stages of the war were now struggling to protect themselves, let alone the lumbering dive bombers, and one by one they fell from the sky. During this period, a German pilot would remark that every time he closed his cockpit, he felt as though he were closing the lid on his own coffin. For the Stuka pilots, their war of terror had come full circle. Whereas the men on the ground once feared the terrible battle cry, now the Stuka pilots feared the awesome drone of a sky full of allied planes, and having almost no defense against them.